Hey guys, welcome to Africa's Weekly. Um, we're here from Kathmandu, Nepal, and uh, joining us is uh, our team, Jake and I, and Gyan Mukia. Gyan Mukia, yes, I'm the tour guide. Yes. I'm English, Japanese, and French language here in Kathmandu, Nepal. And it's my immense pleasure to be with you guys, yeah. Henry and Zek. It's my golden opportunity to be introduced with you. How grateful I am, I can express in the words that so yeah. happy. I'm yeah, like, we can be paradise. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Absolutely. Um, Gian has been a wonderful tour guide for me over the past two days since I've been here in Kathmandu. Um, we traveled around the city to various parts, historic districts, religious centers, ancient temples, um, as well as two incredibly unique Tonga art galleries. Um, so I would love to just, you know, jump into, if Gianni, you could tell us a little bit about where you're from, your education, um, and a little bit of background about who you are. Yes, thank you for your question. Uh, my name is Gian Mukia, and I'm from the mountain. From Kathmandu, it's about 650 kilometers far away, eastern part of Nepal, and very close to Darjeeling, but it's a little bit farther from my place. But I have never been there. And my background, actually background is from the mountain. I went to the school, which is located in the very rural areas. And uh, my education was so-so. I didn't have very good English, all these things. That but I'm talking with you in English right now. When I came to Kathmandu, I went to like American language school and I learned it for about 420 hours, something like that. And I made like this just to communicate with you. So in the very initial days, it was a very difficult time for me to just understand all the different subjects because I was the science student and all the subjects besides the Nepali subject, I had to study it in English language, but it was a very hard time. So I was comfortable to learn English language, but right now I'm okay to communicate with you. And actually I'm from very rural areas called Rabi Pastor and Ilam. And it is in this part of Nepal, nearby Kanchenjunga, the second highest mountain of Nepal. And uh, it's uh, totally different than Kathmandu. And it's uh, my great pleasure just being here in Kathmandu, even I'm from the mountain, and my parents, they did a great job send me here in Kathmandu. And I study here, and I finished my master's degree, maybe it's history, art, and architecture. And I have been guiding as an English-speaking guide, Japanese language, and French language. Yes. So I've been enjoying a lot. And especially I'm interested in public relation. So as many as many can be, I want to meet the people. I want to just exchange the ideas, whatever things. And I want to introduce my country, Nepal, as the birthplace of Buddha and the highest peak in the world, group of the world, Mount Everest. Yeah. In Sagarmata, we call Sagarmata, we call that in Nepali language and Somalungma in Tibetan language. And that is, means mother of the yeah, mother goddess. Mother goddess. Mother goddess. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. And um, what has been so water wonderful about spending time with Jan is that he's been able to help me better appreciate and contextualize the art and architecture of this incredible city and country. Um, so, Jan, where was the the name of the city that we visited yesterday? And the very first city that we visited yesterday called Bhaktapur. Okay. It is also called Bhagyam, and it's one of the medieval cities of like 12th century. Yeah. And from the city center of Kathmandu, which is the capital city of Nepal, it's for about like 15 kilometers. Yeah. It takes for about an hour, and it's one of the historical cities, and many more, many more monuments and temples of Hindu, and some like Buddhist monastery are there, and which is being enlisted as one of the World Heritage Sites by UNESCO since 1979. And especially that city is very famous for the wood carving and the pottery. The wood and, carving was beautiful. Yes, and the special yogurt that we had together, and which is called Juju Dhaud. 
Zizi Zhao. Zizi Zhao, one yeah. of the best. And this is something very traditional city. The city itself looks like the Ponsel, and it looks itself like the town of temples. Almost all the houses are very traditional. Beautiful, so yeah. So with the people like Kirsch in the world, they should come to visit that city as well as yeah. some of the cities. And can you tell us a little bit about the owner of the gallery you introduced me to yesterday yeah. in the Tonga School? Yeah. So one of the galleries that uh, Mr. Henry is interested in art and architecture and he's born about and he must have very deep knowledge about that. And what I thought that uh, so many different informations, so many different informations as well as the knowledge, just to share with him, I just decided that person, Mr. Daya Joshi, uh, who has run one of the business there, uh, or Tank Art Gallery, I introduced him. And it's an average about the background and about the history, all these things uh, he had explained there and hope that Henry had enjoyed that and is very much happy about that just to get oh, the yeah. information. It was, it was really incredible. And Jake, I, I've told you a little bit about mm -hmm. this, but um, this Tonga School painting has been owned and operated by uh, a family for several generations where they teach uh, traditional Tonga painting, which um, artists will create several pieces in their lifetime, um, perfecting and becoming masters in their craft. Um, so they had pieces over a hundred years old, um, and in Nepal, after a hundred years, a piece cannot be sold because it's considered a national treasure. Um, so I actually ended up buying a piece that was 70 years old, um, from a family that had created art for a very long time. And could you tell us a little bit about the specific types of imagery in the Tonga paintings? So there are so many different kinds of Tongas. Still it is uh, depicted in the canvas curtain. Uh, mostly there is like the life cycle, biography. The life of cycle, Buddha. yes. And Can you go into detail about yeah, the life cycle? The life cycle of Buddha, where Buddha was born. Buddha was born here in the southern part of Nepal. It's almost about 400 kilometers far away. And when he was born, and uh, he just started to walk for about 70 steps. And he was one of the Buddhists. His father's name was Sudadan, and he was born in the southern part of Nepal, and that place is called Lumbini, and which is quite famous all over the countries in the world. Yeah. And hmm. about what he did, and all these things, details about until he just passed away. Those things, the story is just presented there as a picture, as Tanka paintings. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Can you guys explain, give a little more context, you know, for the audience, what all it means or what all it takes for a painting to be considered a Tonga painting? Is it just the life cycle of Buddha or is it the way it's actually painted? And some other paintings also they have got there. Like we have three kinds of architecture, four kinds of architecture for... If you could speak building, up. Yeah, building right. the temples, yeah. right? Building the temples. And one of the architecture which is related to Buddhist, that is called stupa. Whenever you take a picture of that stupa as an aerial point of view, how it looks like, and that is called the mandala. That is called the mandala tanka. And if you just focus your mind in the very center, it looks like the stupa, which is like a dome and two eyes in its other direction, along with a question mark, something like that. And something is solid, it's not the hollow. That is very stupid. It is also being presented as a painting, like mandala, something like that. So, Jake, to give you a little more context about Tonga painting, there's specific um, imagery that would define that form of art, but more specifically, it has to be created um, in a strict manner using certain elements on a certain canvas um, created by a master craftsman um, and imagery that is specific to um, the culture. So if we could jump into another form of Tonga painting, which is um, kind of a, this, no. the visualization yeah. of karma. Yeah, right. Karma. If you could explain we, that. Yeah, we were the, the people that have been doing the good karma, that are going to be in the haven, and we were the people that have been doing the very bad karma, that are going to be in the hell, something like that. In very detail, it's explained there in that painting. 
So the imagery, Jake, yes. is entirely showing what uh, different versions of kind of bad karma and hell look like. Yeah. And, um, you know, heaven and peace on earth would look like living with good karma. So on the upper half of the imagery of the painting is um, images related to what the uh, purity and peacefulness of life would look like with good karma. And then beneath it shows, you know, um, the type of temptations uh, people have in society um, in negative realities that people have when they live hell on earth. Um, mm. And ultimately in this religion, yeah, if I'm correct. Yes, that's true. Yeah, that's true. And there wow. are some different kinds of tankas also, which is called the cosmos. Uh, with the people, they want to do something like meditation or yoga. They focus their mind and they centralize their visualization in the center of the cosmos mandala. And they can be just, uh, they don't, uh, they are not diverted their mind. They focus their mind in the very center point and they can feel very relaxed, and very peaceful and calm, something like that. So many different things. Okay. So yeah. almost like, almost like meditation. It sounds exactly. Like. exactly. Very... One more thing I would like to additionally add is that, so some of the tanka, as Henry has already mentioned that, we serve more than 100 years. It is treasured by the country, nation, and the people, something like that. It's the property of something like that. The country, something like that. Yeah, it's and other people. Only the new tanka or something like the gift, something like that. And what happens is that some of the people we say were our antiques, very old tankas, antiques during the time of like Buddhist festival. Some of the highly ranked monks, the lamas, well, uh, they display to the public, and all the people they look at that and they just pay homage on that. And they whisper good luck and good things, all those things. And it is also said that uh, Trinva is also should be placed in the very top place on the Dharma, you know, something like that. It should be in the very right place. And it is also believed that with the people, they go outside uh, at that time, if they have a look on that, and they will have good luck and good fortune. It's a belief. Exactly. Like, yeah. And could you tell us a little bit more about the Tonga paintings that have the lotus flower in the middle? Yeah, uh, normally lotus flower is supposed to be it's, uh, one of the sacred flowers and it's the symbol of like purity, something like that. So lotus flower, mm. even it is a spoon in mud, something like that, but it has got the medicine of like purity and all these things. And something like sacred oh, yeah. flower. Yeah. What, um, what does someone have to go through to be qualified to do these paintings? What kind of process is there? Or do people be a master, Tonga. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And additionally, I want to add more. So whenever uh, the people, they want to have a look or they want to have the paintings, and it depends on some, it depends upon the quality. Whether they are the learners, the beginners, that painting is so so. And whenever they are used to like one year, two years, three years, depends how perfect they are. And by gene also, and they, if they are born just for painting or making tanka, they, are, they become like masters. It depends. It depends. So you have to go to a specific yeah, yeah, school. Yeah, yeah specific. And spend a certain amount of time. People, yeah, and be they, they can join. By yeah, people. they can join the classes. So yeah. if someone wants to learn about tanka painting, there are certain schools, and the schools that we visited uh, today at Bolgana, and they also have some students, and I have seen there some volunteers. We have been just living there. We have been learning there as students. Some of the people there are foreign students. And some of them become very smart within very short and period. It depends. Yes. Like it's exactly like education or study, something like that. So okay. Some of them are very talented. Some of them could learn faster. Some of them, it takes time. Yeah. So, but yeah. they should focus their mind very attentively. Regardless of strict criteria. Yes. Yeah. 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 And um Jake, go ahead. Ask, yeah. ask. So you've you know mentioned a lot about Buddha and Buddhism and it sounds like that plays a super big role in the art and you know architecture, but how do you see that um come into everyday life and just affect the culture of Nepal in general? So about the culture, uh we with the people they are Buddhist, mostly they are having the Tanka painting in their houses, but some of the people, even they are Buddhist, they may not have. 
but mostly they have in their houses, even whatever the religions they are, it doesn't matter. Simply it's a painting and this is just to make visible, this is just to make visible to unvisible artists like that as an interpretation, as I just think like that way. So whatever the religion, just they have it just for good luck and just for as a decorative object in their houses, something like that. So, but depends upon quality, something like that, whatever it is. So some of the people, they want to have it and some of them looking on that, like as an image of God or goddesses, they play on that, depends. So most of the people nowadays, they're having some of the people, some of the people, some different, but it's, it is by playing one of the very vital roles. In context of Nepal, we were the people, mostly here in Nepal, they are Hindus, like 80%, yeah. and like 10% people are Buddhist. Even Buddha was born here. Buddha was born in Lumbini, the birthplace. It's called Lumbini. And maybe they come here once in their lifetime and seeing just the stupas, the architecture, it is stupa or Buddhist. And then what they think is that since we are here in the birthplace of Buddha, why don't we buy something like souvenir? So but even it's being one of the best. So. Yeah. So even so, this country has so much Buddhism. Uh, in terms of the architecture and art that defines the culture, but only 10% of the people are Buddhist? Yeah. Is that yeah, 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 yeah. Officially, it's strictly like that. So even whatever religion that we are here, but we have very good religious stories, and especially in between Hindus and Buddhists and some of the religions. So we didn't have any disputes regarding about the religion. We have very good uh, harmony or being just friends, something like that. So we have very good friendship to all the religions, not only Buddhists and Hindus, some other religions also. Yeah, so we are very proud. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, Let me tell you about, yes, one more thing about that. So in just Nepalese stupa architecture, that as I told you, that is the stupa we call that. So mainly there are three types of architecture for making the shrines or something like that as Buddhist uh, architecture. One is called stupa, which is like a dome. One of the biggest that we saw this afternoon and yesterday. Yesterday we saw, you know, just today we saw both of them. One of the oldest, that is also in Buna, self-existent, more than 2,000 years old. And as a nickname, we call that monkey temple. And the other one is Bodhana, which is one of the biggest. Huge, in huge. That type of architecture is called stupa, and the other one is called chaitya, and it is also called choten in Tibetan language, yeah. which is like the wall. So Both are dedicated to Buddha. Uh, yes, yes. And one more is called the monastery, Bihar, ah. and we have also visited some of the Bihar of yeah. like 12th century, 15th, yeah, 16th century, something like that in pattern yesterday. Yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah, it's incredible. So three kinds of Bihara, yeah. Bihara, Ishtupa, and Saita. These hmm. are the main architecture. And this is it's, it's related. Over. Yeah. Yeah. And okay. could you tell us a little bit about um the art gallery and the owner that you introduced me to today? Yeah. In the uh, location yeah. of that. And the art gallery that we uh, I introduced at the Buddha Bodha Tanga Ishtupa Bodha Ishtupa Tanga. Yeah. And it is belong to Mr. Onil Gesi, and we, he, he has been doing this business. I think about 30 years, yeah, 1990, about 30 years. something like that. And he has been doing this business almost more than three decades. Yeah. And he has been just increasing his business and he's very well known and all the things that, whatever the materials as paintings, he has been just demonstrating and at the same time. So it's very genuine. And Things, different qualities are there. It's like the museum. Even we have so many different mistakes of paintings, but it looks like itself the museum. It, one of the finest art galleries yes. I've seen. Yes. Um, Jake, it was like being in a museum, but you yeah. can buy the work. Yeah. Um, okay. And same quality. Yeah. Um, That's crazy. It's the most yeah. incredible opportunity to be helping them sell their work. That's not fair. And this looks like museum. So mm -hmm. we're interested in it, just can go and have ideas. And he's a very nice person and a very proper person. 
Yeah. Oh, and were, were his kids the ones who sat with us in our meeting? Uh, maybe he, they are his kids and kids, maybe his relatives. Ah, I see. Okay. Um, so, Jake, yeah, we're going to be helping them with project launches. Uh, one of our services, which we provide to artists in our galleries, but it will be um, us helping them sell their inventory to a global audience, which is very exciting. Yeah. Yeah, super excited about that. Is yeah. most of the art there from, you know, strictly Nepal, or do they sell art from all over the world? It's from all over. Um, I mean, all of them, Nepal specifically, yeah, but is Tonga painting from Nepal? Yeah. Yeah. It's super cool. It's like the museum. Even we have so many different stories, yeah. but it looks it looks like the museum. You yeah. can have so yeah. many different informations. Even we have some of all this also very good, but there is something like the museum, one of the biggest. Yeah. Am I right? Oh, yeah. uh, it was like three stories um, yeah. covered with yeah. incredible art, um, and same with the other Tonga school of painting. It was just um, all master craftsmen yeah. um, in their work, so it was really incredible. Um, and, awesome. you know, Jake, I want you to, like, ask a ton of questions about just Hindu uh, culture, mm -hmm. religion, um, because you're also coming from a similar background of our audience, probably not knowing too yeah. much. Um, uh, so use this time. I, I wanted to touch on, and, you know, I think it's super cool, and the rest of the world should look at this as an example for, you know, you're saying that the Hindus and the Buddhists are able to live in harmony and be friends where you know you look at the rest of the world most of the conflict is between these two different religions and um you know do you think it's just just the nature of the religion where you know hinduism you can believe in many gods and it's all about karma and buddhism is more just a way of life and you know seeing life through suffering um you know why do you think that these religions are able to live together so much better than these other religions like you know judaism and islam you know okay let me tell you in brief about this mm -hmm. thing mostly people here are hindus and like 80 percent and 10 percent people are buddhist and some of the religions also that we have so it is said that more than 33 million gods and goddesses that we have for hindus but most of the temples here dedicated to shiva and the Vishnu. And as we went this evening, one of the most famous and one of the most popular, which is very renowned, Pashupatina, that is the temple of Shiva. It's like Mecca for Muslims, Jerusalem for Christians, like that one. So once in their lifetime, we were there, Hindus, if they have chance to go there, they are very proud that I have been to Pashupatina. So it is true that. Uh, only very principal gods and goddesses, we can name them. Like Brahma is supposed to be as a creator, Vishnu as a preserver, and Shiva as a destructor for bad things, good things as a uh, preserver. Most of the temples are dedicated to Shiva and Vishnu. Hey, speak up to yeah. the volume. Yeah, uh, like that. And we believe to gods and goddesses. But as I told you, that more than 30 million gods and yeah. goddesses. Yeah, if you ask me all the names of different gods and goddesses, I can name them. Okay. Shiva, Vishnu, and some other like uh, goddesses like Kali or something like that. Hmm. So something it's such a yeah, peaceful baby, something like that. And yeah. one more thing I want to add is that whenever we make the sacrifice, we make the sacrifices also. As per Hindu religious version, uh, the human beings have five undesirable demerits. And those five undesirable demerits are uh, symbolized by five different animals. Uh, for instance, like if we make the sacrifice of goat, goat is the symbol of lust, and duck, that's the symbol of apathy, and the buffalo, water buffalo, that's the symbol of anger, and then sheep, that's the symbol of stupidity, and the rooster, cock. My pronunciation is not good. Rooster, okay? And that's the symbol of timidity. If we make the sacrifices, timidity. And if we make the sacrifices of those respected animals, and it means that all the undesirable demerits are taken away from our body. Hmm. And on the name of goddess, we make the sacrifices. And then ultimately, we take it back 
and then do the uh, big party, saying that on Prasad there's something, offerings, blessings of the God. Mostly we make the sacrifices on the name of Goddess, and sometimes we make the sacrifice on the name of Vaida. That is the most special aspect of Siva called Vaida. Cool. How influential mm. do you think art is for this culture in general of all of Nepal? Uh, is, so, it very, is it very much a part of it compared to other places in the world, you think? No, uh, it may be, but, which is not good to do sacrifice in all these things. But some of the people are day by day, which is not good practice. Some of the people, they think that way too. And as I explained to you about that, five undeserved demons, if we make the sacrifices, uh, and if we just take it away, all the undeserved demerits, and then we can realize the salvation. Uh, that in Nepali, moksha. Moksha? Uh, moksha. Moksha, salvation. Like nirvana in Buddhism. Yeah, cool. Can you tell us a little bit more about the history of religion in Nepal? Because I think it's so interesting that, you know, Buddha was from there, and yet most of the people are Hindu. Um, yes. So, you know, yes. has that always been the case, or kind of what's yeah. that look like? Yeah. So, about Hinduism, what we can say is that our, uh, we don't have any historical, like, founder of the religion Hinduism, right? Historical something like the founder. But it is, uh, we can see that some of the features of Hinduism, which is traceable, 3,500 years, 3,500 years. Mm -hmm. And uh, regarding about the religion, whether they are Hindus, they are very flexible. They are very flexible. And uh, whenever that we go to the temples, and one of the work that uh, I want to say is that whenever someone goes to a temple as Hindus, and we put it on the forehead with our index finger, it means like the blessing and sunflowers as an offering, on the forehead, on the forehead and maybe yeah. on the head, and it means that I'm good. So whenever we go to the temples, and all the people say that, it's very joyfully, oh, you are going to the temple every month, that's good, you are doing dharma, it's said like that. It means, actually, the meaning of dharma is like karma, but if it is defined in English, I have found that the elevation of spiritual quality, that means dharma. So if you go to temple, if you worship, oh, you are doing dharma, it's good. Let's keep it out. We just make it very joyful. So if you go to the temple, it means it's a good thing. It's good karma. So Muslim people, they prefer to go to the temples mostly. Uh, in general, Saturday is weekly of the year. And people, they go to the temples on Saturday. Some of the days also we can go. Um, but mostly uh, so mm. Saturday is weekly of the so they enjoy going there because they have nothing to do and it's uh, weekly off. So, and one of the things that traditionally I want to share with you, the main God, uh, we just visited this evening, the possible nothing that is the number one, right? Only Hindus are allowed to go inside. That's the temple of Shiva. And there is not any image of Shiva, like as a human being. There is the Shiva Linga, we call it phallus. Phallus, it's so like the male organ and female organ, sky and water, something like that. It's phallus, though, and which is very heavily ornamented with so many very valuable jewelry inside of that. The Sistrine, the Sikh okay. is there, the South Indian. Ocean. And so, uh, one more thing is that, which is quite interesting, you must have seen that. And the son of Shiva, and Shiva is worshipped especially on Monday. If you go to the temples of Shiva on Monday, means it's going to be very crowded. there. So whatever things that, if you have something with it, you should go on Monday. That will be the one of the very sacred day to worship okay. the Shiva, to be full to your wishes. And then he has a son called Ganesha. Ganesha is worship on Tuesday. Ganesha is the god of success, live in head as he has. That's it. Hmm. Incredible. So, yeah. yeah. When people go to the temple, it sounds like it's more to, you know, make a sacrifice or, you know, like be blessed. Is there some sort of religious text where there will be a priest that's teaching people or is it more so just, you know, people kind of know the story of Hinduism and what they're 
what they're worshiping. Um, Because, you know, if you go to, let's say, a Christian church, there's going to be a priest up there reading out the Bible, like giving you a lesson from the Bible. Let me tell you about it in a very simple way. So simply what I'm thinking is that whenever people, for example, for example, if I have something which is in that I promise, for example, so for example, you have something which says that I want to be succeeded in my wishes. It depends on the wishes, what kind of wishes, how big it is, how value it has got, depends. So in advance, I go to the temple and I wish for to, to be succeeded my wish. And if it is very small, if I my wish is fulfilled, and I will come to thank you again with something offerings, I might say. And if my wish is somehow big, as I just uh, like, uh, which is more important to be succeeded, to get succeed on my wishes, accordingly I make the promises. For example, if my wishes is not very normal, very simple one, if something like big one, so if I'm succeeded for love, 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 something like that, and what I do is, I just promise that I'm going to come here with one of the rooster. And if it is succeeded, I will make, sacrifice the rooster. I say like that. And some like offerings, I've been offering. We take rice, rice, flour, flour. Six, some sacred water, and some sweets. And some what's food. it called? Pish? Pish? Uh, the- Puja. 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 Yeah. And yeah, and we should do puja. So puja this happens worship. all over the city, Jake. It's like, yes. can you explain how it's like, it's not just at temples. It's yeah. at like little areas when you're walking around the city are sacred. Yeah. Can you explain that? Yeah, how? puja, yeah. So in some of the places we have like, as a symbol of like statues of something like gods and goddesses, we place there something like stones, which is being done puja, yeah. along with some colorful powders. Some say sticks, some rice. Yes. These are the principal uh, offerings. Mm. We do puja, like that. Puja means pray to pray. So okay. do with that uh, the very thing that I promise. I have promised, like the rooster. And I go there and I make the sacrifice. Thank you very much, my goddess. I, my wishes were fulfilled, and I'm so happy. And I would like to thank for that because of you. You just blessed me. I'm so thankful for that yeah so like that and we i was introduced to two reincarnations if you want to tell a little bit about yeah. that we really yeah some of the hindu people they believe in yeah most of the hindu people they believe in reincarnation. it yeah. said eighty four thousand in reincarnation that we have whenever one one dies you know and then it is supposed to be again he or she is going to be given Maybe. if you do good karma you may be even again like a human being, something like that. It's a belief. I met with the two young reincarnations of the goddesses. Yeah, and as Henry is talking about that, one of the goddesses called Kumari, uh, she's the living goddess that we have seen yesterday in Patan. And this morning also we saw uh, living goddess Kumari in Kathmandu, the rice square. And she's a small girl, let's say, at the age of age. Four, she started being the living goddess, Kumari, we call that. And then right now, she is like nine years old. And she is an incarnation of goddess Taleju. And goddess Taleju, as a human form, she would appear uh, in front of the Mala kings. I'm talking about the medieval period. So let's say about 250, 300 years back. And they would work as a council of the nation mm-hmm. and the people uh, to give sessions and advice for the king, about the nation and people, for betterment, all those things. And they had an agreement. So whenever they would have something, meeting or gathering, something like that. But all of a sudden, the king, the medieval period, all of a sudden, you know, he broke that agreement. He has something different, you know, idea about her, on her. Yeah. And she became very upset. And that was shown, demonstrated beautifully in that painting that we saw. Yes, yes, yes. And where was that? It was in Kathmandu. Uh, a bit yeah. specifically, yeah. it was in the yeah. old palace, right? Yeah, old palace, yeah. And so, Jay, to give you context, this uh, goddess, 
is basically um, there for the kings of Nepal uh, to talk about um, anything in, on their mind to help them make decisions and such. And this beautiful painting in the uh, historic palace demonstrated how she would show her full self as a woman to the king. And she realized that the king was having um, some type of inappropriate sexual thoughts about her. So she never showed herself to the king again. And because of that, she made herself only to be shown in the form of a little girl. Correct? Yes. 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 Um, so it, it, it is beautiful imagery in the painting, but also the meaning of it is why this little girl is the goddess, the uh, human form of her is because that god can now, or that goddess can only now be um, in that form of a little girl because the unsavory uh, yeah, yes. images he was having of her. Yeah. So yeah, it was really, it was really cool. Yeah, and and uh, so furthermore is that, and that king was very much upset about that thing, that she disappeared, and then he appealed and for many days, many months, and at once he had a dream just to select one of the girls from the uh, Buddhist family, Sakya or Bajratari, that is associated with the Buddha, the founder of Buddhism, who was born in Lumbini, Nepal. And then very certain places that we have in the Kathmandu Valley, nearby the house of the Kumari, something very specific monastery that we have. And those girls are known to like Buddhist family, but she is selected as a Hindu goddess, Kumari. She is regarded as incarnation of this devotee and as a religious point of view she has been regarded as one of the most personality and that kumari incarnation and when she is entered into puberty and she is replaced with a new one and she is the she is one of the most important mm. of the people they believe kumari so Mari is in Kathmandu as well as in Patan in Bhaktapur also. But as we saw this morning in Kathmandu, so right now she is like nine years old. And throughout the year, she stays inside of that house of the Kumari. Does not leave. More than 250 years, that house is, along with the caretakers, even her family members, they come once a week, like twice a week, just to meet her. And 352 days she stays there. Wait, yeah, so this is, is, yeah. this is a real girl. Yeah, Not, dude, yeah. she's like a little girl. Yeah, very How random. Like it it, 13 times, 13 times, only she comes out riding in the chariot, along wow. with the authorities. She yeah, stays in there for 362 days of the year. And then all the head of the country and the high dignitaries, like prime minister, minister, mayors, you know, uh, they just pay homage to her for the betterment of the country and the people. Hmm. So 13 times in it, but not regularly, very random. So she came out of a window and like, like, yeah. like, like waved at everyone. But she's yeah. like, oh, oh. there are a lot of take pictures. Yeah. Like it was incredible. Yes. Yes. And How does she get chosen for that role? Yeah. yeah there are a certain members for making selection of 37. Like, yes. Six, uh, seven members are there, like the chief priest of the, the royal family member, but we don't have royal members nowadays because it's federal Republic, democratic country, like the chief priest of like something like president, something like that. And then the chief caretakers, and the chief priest of specific temple, Taleju, and some of the expert or authority, authentic people from the yeah. archaeological department, something like that. Okay. So there are something like seven people and one of the chief caretaker who knows each and every details about Kumari and the chief caretaker of the Kumari or Kathmandu that we saw this morning. Yeah. They have been mm -hmm. serving as caretakers in the, the house of Kumari, seventh generation. Mm -hmm. So it's much more than 400 years. It's incredible. It's the belief that, you know, this goddess has been reincarnated into this girl or is the, like is she seen as a goddess no no she is it is believed that she is the reincarnation of yeah. the goddess yeah. and there yeah. is a very certain family member and there is a very certain community like 18 or 20 monasteries around of that area only from it's like the community 
and okay. among those family members only they can appeal and they can apply for you know, placing their like their daughter as a living goddess and there's 37 attributes that fit yeah, the criteria 30, yeah. and just to become the living goddess she must meet 32 physical requirements exactly. it's excellent like like the eyes she has eyes like the deers the cheek like an apple and she must have very you know black hair as long as long can be she must have balanced it she must have solemn voice she must have low whisper she must have chest like line she must have balanced feet all these things she must have very bass soul all these things these are some of the features about to have as quality of being kumari Wow, very beautiful. As beautiful can be, like that. Okay. Yeah, it's so, really interesting. Yeah. And no one is allowed to take a picture, but when there is a certain festival during the time of certain festival, she comes out as I explained to you thirteen times in a year, yeah. very randomly, and all the photojournalists and all the public they are very much interested in worshiping her, just to pay homage to her, and they take. An opportunity to take the picture by like going very close back, and it has been printed as the postcard, and even you can buy it in the market. But lively whenever we had looked this morning, yeah. So when she is inside of her house, no picture, no picture, no picture. Just yeah, we say namaste, just to pay her homage to her, and just to fulfill our wishes. And just to mm-hmm. saying, say, namaste means I go to you. Namaste wow. all the time. Say, so, namaste in uh, Nepal. It's a greeting, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Like a spiritual way of saying exactly. it. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So like, mm-hmm. Jake, anywhere that you go and you're introduced to someone walking by into like a, a shop or a store, like I was introduced to your friend at the tea shop. Yeah, tea shop. just namaste. Yeah, namaste. Yeah. And uh, nearby that, uh, the Rice Square, Kathmandu, uh, next to the house of the Kumari, there is one of the tea shop, Everest Tea House. And actually, I'm from the eastern part of Nepal, Ilam and Ravi. It's a hilly station. Almost it's for about 1,800 meters, the place where I live, where I was groomed there. And I finished my high school from there. And I was just to study the university. I came to Kathmandu. And that is especially famous for the like tea plantation and very good view of the sunrise and sunset it can be seen there and from uh, that place it can be seen there that's called Ilan for tea plantation black tea so which is very famous there very famous there and all those tea stops are there this place the place where we went to visit this morning next to a house of the Kumari and uh, and we and me and we had tasted that and yeah. i hope that you like it right it's very good yeah um something i want to ask you about is your views around heaven and hell from what you know my understanding is that hindus don't believe in heaven and hell and they almost you know reincarnation takes the place of that you know heaven would be a good reincarnation and hell would be you know a bad reincarnation what are your beliefs and how do Hindus view heaven and hell? <laughs> to be very honest, uh, I don't believe in reincarnation. Whatever the life is going in, it's done here. So hmm. when uh, I'm trying to do my best. You live heaven, heaven on earth almost, yeah. hell on earth. But uh, so, yeah, some of the people, yeah, some of the people, they believe in incarnation, reincarnation, something like that. So we should do all the time, like very good karma. But some of the people, you know, they believe whatever things that it is happened, but it's seen here. If you do good karma here, you are going to be happy. And some of the people, so, you know, depends, you know, but mostly the people, we were, they live in the mountain. So in my context, I'm talking about in my area, in my village, my forefathers, mm-hmm. my brothers, uncle, they believe in me, guys. So I should do good karma. I'm going to live on that. Like human beings, something like that. It depends. It's an every individual. I don't want to just represent what other people they think. But in Hinduism, we believe in reincarnation. 
something like that. And even as we talk about the so Kumari is supposed to be reincarnation of Goddess Dali. Yeah, it is the belief. And that tradition has been going on for many, many years. Many, many centuries. Exactly, we didn't have exact that ever. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's cool. Something that we've kind of been talking about lately, Henry, and I see it a lot in religion, and, you know, obviously in these, um, you know, Buddhist and Hindu paintings, but it's kind of the ability of artwork to portray things that you can't put into words. And, you know, I wonder if that's kind of why so many religions use paintings as a way to portray their religion. Like you walk into a, you know, Christian cathedral that's been around for thousands of years in like Italy, there's all these paintings everywhere kind of portraying different stories. And it sounds like a lot of these paintings in, um, you know, Nepal are showing the life cycle or showing the story of a certain goddess. Um, it just kind of really goes to show the power of art and how it can explain things in a way that just words can't, you know? Yeah, he's, um, yeah, he's basically explaining how these imageries capture such complex ideas and, um, He's asking more so, like, do you think that relates to Hinduism and Buddhism? Yeah. Or not even as a question, but just as yeah, an statement. observation. Um, yeah. And you know, I, I totally agree. I mean, yeah. that's what Gyan has been so helpful with helping me realize. It's like, these concepts are both complex, but also very simple. But the way the artwork captures it, it's like saying a bunch of different things all at once and you're looking at it and you're feeling it and you're appreciating it and you know what it means to the Nepalese people. Correct? Yeah. And one more thing that is that uh, we were that Hindus or Buddhists here in the context of Nepalese society. So I just represent my family members. Uh, whenever they go to the temples, they have something we say they go to the temples. And all the wishes they want to be fulfilled, and they ring the bell. Whenever we go to the temples of Hindus, there is the bell, and they ring the bell, and they sprinkle the holy water. They just light the fire in the sticks, and they sack it just in front of the statues, something like that. And they sprinkle the flour, rice, something of points like that, and they put the light fire. Like in sticks and some like bottle lamps that we have. But sometimes, you know, what I asked to my wife, you are going to the temple where you are just to fulfill my wishes. And do you know that why you are ringing the bell? What is the meaning of that? What she says is no idea, just only all the people they are ringing the bell and I'm doing the same. But actually, the meaning of ringing the bell, since I'm a tourist guy, I'm asked the question and then. I had found one of the books and it is interpreted that there, whenever you ring the bell, minds of the devotees upon the name upon the name of the gods and goddesses. That's the meaning. Of it. And I just remind, who cares? You know, okay, okay, okay. That's it. You know, even some other Hindus also. Whenever we ask them, sometimes I make a joke or something. I want to know about that, what they are thinking about. Religion and all these things. What you are putting the hand, just, you know, my wishes were fulfilled, and I'm just very much devoted to the gods and goddesses. But you also ring the bell. Do you have any idea? We should ring the bell. If we don't ring the bell, what happens? No, no, we should do it. So, do you know any meaning about ringing the bell? Do you have any idea? No idea. Just Dharma. I'm doing Dharma. Hmm. Just, it's good energy. Yes, yes, yes good energy. energy. Exactly. Which is really yeah. cool. Yeah. So yeah. one more thing I want to add is that whenever we go to the Hindu temple, we have the bell, and whenever we go to the stupas, the Buddhist shrine, there is the prayer wheel. Inside of that prayer wheel, there is the rice paper. On that rice paper, there is written the hymn in Tibetan language. But Om Mani Padme, or sometimes it is also pronounced Om Mani Padme. 
right? So it means I'm the only jewel in the center of the motion. It should be clockwise direction. It should be clockwise direction. And whenever we make a circle of any temple, shrines, or stupas, it should be clockwise direction. It should not be just opposite. It looks very fun. Nobody just opposes, nobody is just against of you, but it looks fun. So it should be clockwise direction. So whenever we worship the God and goddesses, we put our hands on the statue and we toss it and we bow our head and we put our hand on our forehead. I should be blessed. Thank you for everything. And we could take, a, as I showed you before also, with the index finger on the statue, there would be colorful powders. And then I pick it up and I put it in my, in my forehead just for as I'm blessed. I feel very relaxed and very energetic. Hmm. That is a very well simple interpretation. Even you can get so many different interpretations, but only I can realize and I can feel. That is very sentimental explanation, how we feel. Even you can get so many informations in Google, and something like that. Yeah. 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 Totally. Um, Absolutely. Well, you know, Jan, so grateful for your time today, you know, sharing everything you know about you know nepal and hinduism and the art uh, this has been this has been great i'm sure the audience you know is really going to love it and you know if you're watching thanks for thanks for sticking around hope you guys learned something and um, you know we're really excited to be able to showcase some of this artwork uh henry if you want to touch on that a little bit absolutely um i'm incredibly grateful to jan for the introductions he's had with these art galleries and also just the immense um, detail to the knowledge he shared with me about his culture and this beautiful country. Uh, so first, thank you for that. So do I. So yeah. am I. It's um, my immense pleasure to be connected with you and whoever the viewers, your clients, your friends, kids and kids, I would like to welcome to our country Nepal, the country of Buddha, the founder of Buddhism, and the country of Kumari, the living goddess. In the country of Mount Everest, the roof of the world, 8,848 meters and 86 centimeters. Thank you all. Thank you. I'm very much proud. Thank you for this golden opportunity. I salute all of you. Namaste. Thank you. Namaste. Thank you. Please do visit to our country, Nepal. Thank you. Awesome. So uh, thank you. Yeah. And uh, we will be revealing a lot of the inventory from Tonga School of. Uh, our dealership and we look forward to getting that to you all uh thank you guys for uh watching jake this is fun yep uh, thank awesome. you guys yep. thank great you. Thank bye you. thank you i take my little best thank you thank you best regards namaste namaste namaste